here. Yeah, I know. I'm sure you could crowd Washington, D.C. suits in the audience. What's that? Not the usual crowd of Washington, D.C. suits in the audience. That's true, which is refreshing. <laughs> uh, how do you pronounce that? What was his name again? Robillard. Okay. Palau. Which I didn't realize that. Okay, good. And it wasn't, okay. The Committee on Science, Space, and Technology will come to order. With that objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing, Dyslexia and the Need to Read, H.R. 3033, the Research Excellence and Advancements for Dyslexia Act. Uh, let me say we welcome everyone here today, but particularly those who are under 18, and it's nice to see them uh, represented in the audience. I'm going to recognize myself for an opening statement and then the ranking member. Uh, today's hearing is on H.R. 3033, the Research Excellence and Advancements for Dyslexia or READ Act, and the need to prioritize investments in dyslexia research conducted by the National Science Foundation. I want to thank the many co-sponsors of the READ Act, especially former Science Committee member Representative Julia Brownlee. We co-chair the Bipartisan Congressional Dyslexia Caucus. The caucus now has more than 100 members of Congress. Together, we champion an increased public awareness of dyslexia, which affects an estimated 8.5 million school children and one in six Americans in some form. Despite this huge number, many Americans remain undiagnosed, untreated, and silently struggle at school or work. Too many children undiagnosed with dyslexia have difficulties in the classroom and sometimes drop out of school and face uncertain futures. In a hearing last year on the science of dyslexia, one of the best attended hearings of this committee, experts testified how research in the area of neuroscience has led to practical ways of diagnosing and dealing with dyslexia and why more research was necessary. Parents and teachers both must receive training in how to identify and test students for dyslexia, and the development of special curricula and educational tools can better enable students to read at their fullest potential. The expert witnesses at our hearing were clear. Dyslexia is the most common reading disability, yet those who suffer from it often have normal or above average intelligence. There is no proven correlation between dyslexia and intelligence. Albert Einstein had dyslexia, and Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, Nicholas Tesla, Thomas Edison, and Steve Jobs are a few of the most recognized, brilliant innovators and inventors who overcame dyslexia. With more research, greater awareness of how to identify dyslexic students, better curricula, and more resources in the hands of parents, teachers, and students, we can develop the potential of many of those students who might become the next Einstein. But if you can't read, it's hard to achieve. The READ Act is a step in the right direction to help those with dyslexia. The bill ensures that our children have the means to succeed. The READ Act requires the National Science Foundation budget to include a specific line item for the Research and Disabilities Education Program. The bill authorizes at least $5 million annually for merit-reviewed, competitively awarded dyslexia research projects. It uses funds already appropriated for the NSF Research and Related Activities Account or the Education and Human Resources Directorate for those projects. It does not increase overall federal spending at the NSF. The READ Act supports the practical research our expert witnesses said is most needed. Early identification, professional training for teachers and administrators about dyslexia, and evidence-based educational tools and curricula. This is well within the scope of NSF's current science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education programs. Our witnesses today have personal experiences with this issue. They routinely help students with dyslexia in the classroom and identify students who can benefit from additional instruction tailored for their unique situation. They develop practical curricula to help children and adults with dyslexia and some are parents of dyslexic students who want to make a difference not only in their children's lives, but also in the lives of others. And we'll put something up on the big screen right now. 
And October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. One year ago, in conjunction with our Science of Dyslexia hearing, the website understood.org was launched. This website provides some tests for dyslexia and other resources. Since understood.org went live, over six million people have visited the website and it now attracts about one million different visitors every month. After today's hearing, I would like to welcome members of the committee to a reception in room 2325 down the hall being hosted by the National Center for Learning Disabilities along with the International Dyslexia Association, Decoding Dyslexia, the Learning Disabilities Association of America, Dyslexia Advantage, and Learning Ally. By the way, I said just members of the committee, I mean everybody in this room is welcome to that reception down the hall, to the, that direction. Uh, for many people, dyslexia is considered a disability, but if we change the way we approach this subject, we can turn that disability into an opportunity for a brighter and more productive future. Uh, that concludes my opening remarks, and the ranking member, uh, the gentlewoman from Texas, um, Ms. Johnson, is recognized for hers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. I appreciate um, that you're holding this hearing. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. I have known several people who have dyslexia. Although dyslexia is a lifelong condition, if someone gets proper diagnosis and instructions, uh, they can succeed in school and go on to have successful careers. I would not be surprised if we didn't have some examples in this room today. I know some very personally who are very successful. Science, Space, and Technology Committee oversees most of the federal non-defense R&D, but we do not directly oversee the lead agency but for dyslexia research, which is NIH. However, we do not oversee, moreover, we do not oversee the Department of Education, which supports educational programs and provides services for students with learning disabilities, including dyslexia. However, we do oversee the National Science Foundation, which supports fundamental research that provides a foundation for dyslexia research, as well as educational research. Although several of the directorates of NS NSF fund research that contributes to the science of dyslexia. The majority of the MSS funded research related to dyslexia is supported by the Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences Directorate and the Education and Human Resources Directorate, two important NSF directories. For example, the Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences Directorate funded the Science of Learning Centers program we supported six large-scale, long-term interdisciplinary centers that have made significant contributions to learning research. I look forward to hearing Dr. Teller about the temporary dynamics of learning center of which she is co-director. The center focuses on understanding the role that timing plays in learning and applying that research to improving educational tools and practices. Since processing language is one of the fastest things that we do, it is clear that timing plays a critical role in understanding speech and language. While the center's program is not awarding new grants, SBE continues to be a leader in funding science of learning research. Today we are going to talk about HR 3033 the Research Excellence and Advancements for, for Dyslexia, or the READ Act. This bill would require NSF to have a line item for the Research of Disabilities Education Program and NSF's Education Directorate, and to fund at least $5 million a year on dyslexia research. The research would be on the science of dyslexia, including the early identification of individuals with dyslexia, professional development for teachers and school administrators, and curricula development and educational tools. I fully support funding more research in language-based learning disabilities, including dyslexia. But I do have to point out that this bill does not provide NSF with additional money to fund that research. 
Rather, it requires NSF to use existing funding. Although I support more funding for dyslexia research, in the current environment of, of, the, of flat research budgets, I would, would have liked to see an additional money provided for the priority in this bill. But with that said, I do support the goals and intentions of the legislation, and I want to thank our witness for being here today. I look forward to the testimony, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back. And thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, before I welcome our witnesses, I want to note that, unfortunately, uh, Geraldine Tinsey Miller from the Texas State Board of Education is not able to testify today uh, due to a death in her family late last week. Ms. Miller shepherded bills to the Texas State Legislature to help students with dyslexia and has been an advocate on the issue for many decades. Now, with that objection, I'd like to include in the hearing record the history of dyslexia law that Ms. Miller wrote and provided to the committee. I would also like to include in the hearing record a letter we received yesterday from Dr. Sally Shaywitz of the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. Dr. Shaywitz testified last year before the Science Committee. Her letter states in part, quote, the READ Act will help to put knowledge into the science of dyslexia into action more quickly. Everyone who is a parent, teacher, or researcher working with a dyslexic child should support H.R. 3033, the READ Act, end quote. And with that objection, that'll be made a part of the record as well. Uh, let me go to our witnesses. Our first witness, Ms. Barbara Wilson, is the co-founder and president of Wilson Language Training, which provides professional support to American educators. Ms. Wilson oversees graduate and clinical courses to help students with language-based learning disabilities. She has over 30 years of experience in working with people with dyslexia. Ms. Wilson received her bachelor's degree from Fitchburg State University and her master's in education from Simmons College in Massachusetts. Our next witness, Dr. Paula Talal, is the senior research scientist at the Center for Human Development at the University of California, San Diego. She also serves as an adjunct professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies and is the founder and director of the Scientific Learning Corporation. Dr. Talal is a cognitive neuroscientist and board-certified clinical psychologist who has authored over 200 professional publications and holds several patents. Dr. Talal received her bachelor's degree from New York University and her PhD from Cambridge University. Dr. Rachel Robillard, our final witness, is an assistant director in the Austin Independent School District where she helps to provide accommodations to students with disabilities. She is recognized for the many improvements she helped implement in how the school district approaches dyslexia evaluation and intervention. She previously taught in several Austin independent school districts and has taught in the teacher preparation program at the University of Texas, as well as in the educational psychology departments at both the University of Texas and Texas State University. Dr. Robillard remains an adjunct faculty at both universities. Dr. Robillard received her bachelor's degree in elementary education in Spanish and her master's and PhD in educational psychology from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, we welcome you all, and Ms. Wilson, if you'll begin. Thank you, Chairman <coughs> Smith, for your dedication to individuals with dyslexia and to all here working for the betterment of their lives. This is a critical time as many states are recognizing the existence of dyslexia but need further guidance on how to prepare their teachers to effectively teach these students and how to implement the instruction with success. 30 years ago, I was hired to test <coughs> students in grades K through 12 referred for an educational evaluation. I quickly realized that by far, the most common reason for referral was the inability to read. Following testing, I led the team meeting to determine an instructional plan. At first, I enthusiastically shared what we would do to teach the child to read. Unfortunately, that soon changed as I did many three-year re-evaluations which demonstrated that what we were doing was not working. In fact, after three years without progress, the students became even more desperately behind. My search to help these students led me to Massachusetts General Hospital's Language Disorders Unit where I did clinical training with individuals diagnosed with dyslexia using a methodology called Orton-Gillingham. I was excited to see that it worked 
and also discouraged that this teaching knowledge was limited in reach, often only available in private schools costing $20,000 or more per year. For five years, I continued at Mass General Hospital part-time um, teaching adults diagnosed with dyslexia. Concurrently, I founded the Wilson Learning Center with my husband, Ed. Students who had long struggled despite IEPs and teachers' efforts came to the center to learn to read. During this time, I developed the Wilson Reading System. Soon, I was invited to meet with special education directors from 10 nearby school districts who asked me to work with their staffs. Parents were demanding that they teach like we did at the center. Thus, I shifted focus in 1988 to provide both curricula and professional learning to teachers in public schools. My work with adults taught me that it was possible to teach these individuals to read, but if they don't learn to do this while still in school, too often their paths in life are filled with significant failure and distress. I wish I could tell you that the beginning of my story could not be repeated in 2015 because all teachers are now well prepared to teach students with dyslexia. Sadly, that is not true. The same scenario plays out over and over again across this country today. A student cannot read and is referred to special education where teachers are unprepared to teach them. It should not be this way. Research has identified the necessary instruction the individuals with dyslexia need, as the previous panel on the science of dys dyslexia shared with you. Teachers desperately want to teach their students how to read, but most teaching degree programs do not include the in-depth practical work needed to gain the skills to do this with their most challenged students. School districts throughout the country have recognized this gap and contract with us to provide the necessary training. At times we are brought in as the result of a due process hearing for a student who is desperately behind. Our extensive training yields a certification and includes expert supervision of teachers as they work with a student who has a significant reading disability. Teachers who previously had earned their reading or special education degrees often express, why didn't I learn to do this before? Wilson has certified 25,000 dyslexia specialists in public schools in 50 states, and we now partner with six universities that embed the certification into their teaching degree programs. Individuals with dyslexia can absolutely learn to read if working with a knowledgeable teacher under the right conditions. I've witnessed thousands of students who are unable to read even basic words when they were past elementary grades, later learn to read with a well-trained teacher, go on to college, and often choose careers in engineering and science. Technology aids such as audiobooks can assist these students, but they should not replace instruction that will actually teach the student how to read independently. Further advances in technology will help us scale effective instruction to students, but teachers are also an important part of the equation. Providing teachers with knowledge and skills is necessary, but not sufficient. Implementation science informs us that successful results will only be realized if a school is structured to enable these students to provide the needed instruction. I believe that the READ Act is important to bridge the gap between what research says and what we should do for students with dyslexia and what is actually done in our schools today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson and Dr. Talal. Good morning. I'm Paula Talal and I'm a research scientist and co-founder of Scientific Learning Corporation, a neuroscience-based educational software business that has been actively translating research aimed at remediating language and reading problems for almost two decades. Today I'll testify to the fact that there is an epidemic of reading failure, that we have both the scientific evidence and novel interventions to treat effectively. What we do not have is an effective roadmap for implementing evidence-based tools and technologies on a broad scale or a mandate for our schools to use these evidence-based advances to help millions of struggling readers. The heartfelt message I wish to convey to you today is that while failing to learn to read is not life-threatening, it certainly can be life-destroying. There's ample research that demonstrates that the factors that cause reading failure begin well before the child enters formal education. 
This research has shown that even in infancy, the precursors to reading failure can be identified reliably in the form of slow and inconsistent auditory processing. This auditory processing constraint cascades over the early years of life, disrupting the development of distinct phonological representations in the brain, <coughs> oral language, and ultimately reading. Processing the individual sounds or phonemes inside of words is the fastest thing the human brain has to do. In order to learn to read, a child must become aware that words are made up of individual phonemes and it is these sounds that the letters represent. This process is called phonological awareness. Decades of research has demonstrated that failure to become phonologically aware is at the heart of reading failure. Put simply, when it comes to auditory processing, children with language learning problems are operating on the equivalent of dial-up speed while good language and reading skills require a child to operate on the equivalent of high-speed internet. Traditional tools for teaching, reading, regardless of how expertly or how often they're applied, will not work for most struggling readers until these more foundational skills are remediated. Throughout life, but especially early in life, the brain is literally shaped anatomically and physiologically by experience. This experience-driven organization of the brain is called neuroplasticity. Understanding neuroplasticity and the variables that drive it has the potential to absolutely revolutionize interventions for struggling readers by directly remediating their auditory perceptual phonological awareness and language problems. In 1994, I began a collaboration with Dr. My Michael Mersnick, a world expert on neuroplasticity, with the goal of integrating advances in neuroplasticity and learning disorders. In the ensuing 20 years, both behavioral and neuroimaging studies have demonstrated that the foundational auditory processing and language skills known to lead to reading failure are highly modifiable and can be brought into the normal range in just a few months using intensive neuroplasticity-based training exercises disguised as computer games. We co-founded Scientific Learning Cooperation to translate these research advances into practice in classroom tools that could broadly be scaled and efficacy tested in real-world classrooms. These evidence-based educational tools are distributed under the brand name Fast for Word and Reading Assistant and have been used in over 12,000 U.S. schools with as many as 70,000 students a week. The cumulative efficacy data obtained when schools implement these programs rigorously is very positive, especially when compared longitudinally to students' previous performance using traditional methods. Thomas Gibbs Elementary School in St. Mary's Parish, Louisiana is one of the many schools that have used Fast for Word and Reading Assistant. Before implementing these tools, only 19% of fourth grade students scored basic or above in language arts on their statewide achievement tests, placing this school in the bottom quartile statewide. After two years of use, Thomas Gibbs School had moved into the top quartile statewide with 81% of students now scoring basic or above in language arts. So here's my news flash. Research shows that reading success relies on a solid foundation of rapid and consistent auditory processing and oral language. Traditional reading approaches presuppose that a child has these foundational skills, but this is just not the case. Not providing educators with evidence-based tools to remediate the foundational processing skills that are well known to be precursors to reading failure is equivalent to demanding that a builder construct the third floor of a school without having the tools to build a sufficiently strong first and second floor, and then wondering why the school keeps collapsing. I'd like to close with some recommendations offering um, for HR 3033. As Ms. As Ms. Johnson mentioned, NSF has already recognized the gulf between scientific knowledge and translation into education and set out to bridge this gulf by creating six science of learning centers, including the Temporal Dynamics of Learning Center at the University of California, San Diego, which I co-direct. The 10 years of funding of these science of learning centers is coming to a close. My first recommendation is to capitalize on the advances these centers have already made to design professional development courses on the new science of learning, specifically as applied to early identification and remediation of learning impairments. We must leverage existing federal investment. My second recommendation focuses on, proving, on improving the translational method itself. 
Translation and dissemination into classrooms on the scale needed to address our epidemic of reading failure is painfully and frustratingly slow. What are urgently needed are actionable methods that result in terminating the equivalent of a one-lane country road from the laboratory into the classroom into a bi-directional superhighway to improve the prospects of the millions of children with reading impairments for decades to come. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this important bill, and I look forward to your questions. And thank you, Dr. Talal and Dr. Robillard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Johnson, and distinguished members of the committee for inviting me to testify today. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the importance of focusing on the issue of dyslexia, a disability affecting one in six students that unfortunately goes largely unnoticed in federal politics. I currently coordinate all student 504 services for the Austin Independent School District where I oversee our district's dyslexia services program. Our department works with each of the 129 Austin campuses to provide professional development and guidance to help teachers understand the indicators of dyslexia so we can identify students as early as possible and provide that intervention that's needed. This is a significant change from the previous model and progress is still not as swift as we would like. We had approximately 2,000 students identified with dyslexia when I began this process in 2013. With concerted effort, we've now identified around 5,000 students, but that is still only about 5% of our overall student population in AISD. In May of 2014, at the urging of a member of our Board of Trustees, we began allocating funds to provide teacher training so that some teachers could become certified academic language therapists, or CALTs. A call can provide the most advanced and efficacious type of dyslexia intervention available. Our goal is to have at least one call for every campus. 18 months into the program, we're now 61 teachers toward that goal. This effort, fully funded by local dollars, comes at great cost to the district and only provides training for one teacher per school. However, additional professional development, including training and materials, is made available for all K through 12th grade teachers so they can better understand dyslexia and how to deliver curriculum in an accessible manner for all of the identified students. Dyslexia impacts 10 to 20 percent of students in K through 12 with varying levels of severity. Ideally, teacher preparation programs would include coursework dedicated to identifying and teaching students with dyslexia, a disability which has a high rate of impact on literacy acquisition regardless of socioeconomic status or race. Ultimately, the greatest impact would be, providing, be provided by training all pre-service teachers to identify and teach dyslexic students, making the possibility of having specialized reading task forces for dyslexia at each campus a natural byproduct. In my position coordinating 504 services, as well as in my private practice as a neuropsychologist, I strongly encourage support for the READ Act. Having specified annual funds devoted to dyslexia re research that focuses on best practices in early identification, professional development for teachers and administrators, and curriculum development and evidence-based educational tools for children with dyslexia can only improve the opportunities of all students to have access to an education that allows each of them to learn to read. At the university level, this would lead a shift toward increased pre-service development in areas that address basic reading deficits and their neurobiological etiology, as well as the understanding of language development and how it's influenced by dyslexia. A few universities have such programs, but most do not address dyslexia in any format during pre-service training. Lack of teacher training and understanding the indicators of dyslexia causes students to be missed or even misidentified as having other learning issues. Teachers deserve this training. Identifying dyslexia is only the first step of the process. To fully address learning difficulties for dyslexic students, we must keep the disorder in mind when designing classroom instruction, implementing technology plans, planning for social and emotional learning, understanding how to provide parent support and engagement, and training our administrators to be knowledgeable about appropriate identification and intervention. Dyslexia is not a disorder that can be compartmentalized. It is not just a deficit, but it carries with it inherent strengths that have been recognized for decades. These might include other areas of academic strength, creative ways of thinking, more acute perceptual reasoning, and many other traits. 
When dyslexia goes unidentified and undiagnosed, these strengths are often suppressed, and the lack of understanding frequently leads to both student and staff frustration. It is not uncommon for unidentified dyslexic students to become unmotivated or to have behavioral problems, and they often perform significantly below potential academically. Unidentified, their underlying strengths may never be discovered. The READ Act is a necessary flotation device to bring scientific knowledge about dyslexia up to a more universal understanding and to enhance our ability to make the practical application of science to practice more seamless for educators and students. Policies such as found in the READ Act will allow dyslexic students access to early identification as well as appropriate literacy instruction and the opportunity to develop their potential to the fullest. Our prison population is replete with dyslexic individuals who have been identified too late. While dyslexia identification and intervention is not likely to be the entire answer to the school to prison pipeline, it certainly seems to be a key factor that if better understood could be addressed in a systematic and effective manner. We will all benefit at every level by investing in research concerning dyslexia and all issues related to that disorder. Thank you for inviting me to testify. And thank you, Dr. Robillard. Uh, it's my understanding that the gentleman from California, Mr. Takano, has an urgent need to get to another meeting, so I'm going to recognize him first for questions with the understanding, of course, that he joined the caucus and co-sponsor the bill. <laughs> uh, the gentleman from California Yay. is recognized. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm already a member of the caucus, I discovered. I, I will announce my support and uh, co-sponsorship of the bill. The gentleman, uh, recognize for an extra minute on that. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, I am so grateful for this hearing. I'm so grateful for the work you've already done in your leadership. If we can do something about dyslexia in this country, uh, we will have done a great thing uh, to help uh, alleviate so much unnecessary suffering uh, among all sorts of people in our country. So I thank you, thank you, thank you. As a former teacher of 22, 23 years, uh, I gotta tell you, uh, uh, I began my teaching career armed with an Ivy League degree and uh, I could analyze literature uh, but I was little prepared uh, for the first 10 years of my teaching career to deal. I, could, I didn't even know I had dyslexic children in my classroom, my young uh, and kids. And it wasn't until I did a literacy training that I began to even scratch the surface. And once I began to identify them, profoundly dyslexic uh, students, I would try to get them into special ed, but special ed was not equipped. The teachers did not know how to address it. They, they had no more knowledge about what to do with dyslexia than I did. And I had to try to teach myself, but of course, with all the other things that are going on with a classroom teacher, uh, that sort of training, I mean, I needed training. I, and the, and I'm, I'm just eager, Mr. Chairman, to go visit. I hope that we might have a chance to go visit some of these uh, facilities and what they're doing. I would like to know what it is. I mean, I, I learned things like uh, the inside-out strategy, uh, you know, with blended sounds at the beginning. Uh, I, I had a kid who could not read the word strip because there are three consonants that begin that word, and they struggled with it. But if we began from the inside out, we said rip, trip, strip, uh, that was a strategy that improved uh, their ability to decode those words. Uh, I learned about phonemic awareness. There is a science to this stuff, uh, and so I'm excited. Uh, I've asked my staffer to take a look at how we can review the prison population and figure out how many of our prisoners are having uh, are, are dyslexic. I think mean, that's an important thing for us to know. Um, so I'm just so excited about this hearing, and uh, uh, there's so much that can come of this. So I, Dr. Dr. Talal, I want to ask you a question. Uh, why do so many English language learners and children from poverty struggle with learning to read? Thank you for that really insightful question. Um, there's a good deal of research which I have covered directly in my written testimony that I would ask you to review, uh, specifically on children from poverty and English language learners. And to address this quickly, I would like to say that children from poverty also have linguistic impoverishment. That is that research has shown that the difference between children from high socioeconomic class families and low socioeconomic class families is a 30 million word gap in the sheer number of words they have ever been exposed to. What we know from neuroplasticity research is that we literally have to set our own brains up based on experience. And the most important experiences we get as an infant 
is the sounds of our own native language. And that's what we have to use to establish these basic phonological categories to build our efficient and automatic auditory, rapid auditory processing systems. And if we don't hear words, we're just not going to have them. And so the end product is a problem with rapid auditory processing, language developmental delay, subsequently not having the foundations for literacy. For children who are English language learners, they have not heard the sounds, the phonological sounds, that are important for learning English. So they have to be given these sounds in a very um, systematic way. Systematic. Uh, yes. So the phonemic awareness, it's uh, often very tedious. Uh, right. uh, it, it, it takes a lot of creativity for the teacher to be able to develop that. Right. Uh, this is where awareness. technology can come in. We often ah. say, now what technology has to offer is the ability to offer more intense learning trials per unit time than can ever be provided by a teacher no matter how well trained they are because computers just can deliver much more information with stimulus, response, correct and timely rewards. And so what we often say at Scientific Learning Corporation is let computers do what computers do best, which is the repetition, repetition, repetition that the brain needs to set up its own auditory and linguistic systems so that teachers can do what teachers do best. We need to focus on giving teachers these new and improve technological tools that allow them to build these fundamental processing and linguistic skills so that by the time they try to use their more traditional methods, they will actually have the ability for them to work. So the, the, the technology is really the basis, to the, the foundation, the physical foundation, the stimulus response, the, the neural pathways in the brain, right. uh, to develop that fluency uh, in being able to decode words at a very physical level. Mm -hmm. uh, we all have this phenomena, we know this phenomena of uh, I read it but I don't understand it. Uh, and that's where the teacher comes in to be able to, uh, after the student be able, is able to physically decode the words, right. uh, to be able to uh, work with that student in comprehension and, mm -hmm. and the critical thinking. So we need the teacher in the process. But Absolutely. The very, but at the very, but, but this, I, I hear what you're saying, because for the teacher to be able to do this with every single student in a very tedious, systematic way, too much labor involved and, and not the best use. But if there's a technology, that's, that's, that's really promising news. I've uh, taken my six minutes, Mr. Chairman. I, I've got to ironically get to uh, Education and Workforce Committee. Uh, we've got to do supplemental. I hope you will urge uh, Chairman Klein and the subcommittee chairman to also uh, Let's delve into this. On. This is a great bipartisan project. I, that's, I love this. Okay. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Takano. And also, let me say, I think Mr. Takano may be the only former teacher on this committee, so we appreciate the perspective that he brings. By the way, if he's not the only former teacher, I will be hearing about it shortly. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'll recognize myself for questions, and let me address my first one to Ms. Wilson. Um, you developed a reading system that led to, quote, rewiring of the brain to function similarly to the brain of a good reader, end quote. That is amazing. Can you describe that to us briefly? Yes. Um, yes, uh, the reading, do you mean describe the reading system briefly? Yes, if you can. Yes, the reading system is based on Orton-Gillingham principles of instruction or multisensory structured language instruction. And programs that are MSL, um, what we do is work with students building up their understanding of the language structure right from the beginning. So as you heard earlier, um, the student needs to understand how to process sounds and understand um, from what they hear how sounds work in words. And so you go right back to the very beginning and do that with your students. Um, beyond that, that's the beginning step. The students really need to understand how that sound system relates to the structure of words in syllables right. and understanding prefixes and suffixes. So phonology is one piece and morphology of words 
which are the p smallest units of meaning within a words. Right. Um, so students need to understand everything about language structure. Okay. Um, and it's words, it's um, sentences, and text structure. Okay, thank you. By the way, you, I, you're familiar with Shakespeare quote that says, "All well, all's well that ends well." Yes. It sounds like you're saying, "All's well that begins well." Yes. On the other <laughs> side, uh, Dr. Talal, let me ask you a question, and that is, what? Uh, is the best way to detect dyslexia earlier, just kind of what we're talking about across the board? Well, interestingly, um, the precursors to dyslexia can be detected quite reliably, even in infancy, in the form of slow Amazing. auditory processing. And my colleague, <coughs> Dr. Akeville Benesich at Rutgers University, found that children that were born into families with a family history of language learning problems were 50% more likely to develop uh, reading problems later in life. She subsequently showed that the speed of auditory processing of simply detecting differences between two brief tones separated by small gaps of time was the single best predictor in seven-month-old babies to subsequent oral language development and oral language development subsequently is the single best predictor for reading and reading failure. So there's this cascade, which I call the language to literacy continuum, which right. begins with slow auditory processing, which interrupts the brain's ability to effectively and efficiently process the sounds of language, which are necessary, are the unnecessary components, as we're hearing, right. for being able to hear the small sounds okay. and words and learn that those are the letters that, words, that are in the words, and you can't really learn to read without that. Great. By the way, I liked your earlier metaphors between the dial-up versus the high-speed internet and the uh, country road versus the superhighway. That's a nice description. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lopillard, um, this is really just following the trend here, uh, but what do you think is the quickest and most efficient way to test and identify those with dyslexia? We have good tools. I think that we need to be applying them a lot earlier than we typically do. Uh, the tools that we have, I think, could be improved upon. And I thoroughly agree that that oral language, uh, it, our speech pathologists that identify our students at three and four years old for PPCD programs in schools would certainly be our allies in, in really identifying these students very early. Their screening that they do for that process could be expanded on fairly easily to identify these students that are needing this early intervention. Okay, good. I'd like to ask you all a question, and we can start with Ms. Wilson. If you'll each give me two strengths that you all think are inherent with those with dyslexia. Okay, Ms. Wilson. Absolutely, the um, perceptual strengths. Um, so often they make wonderful architects and have incredible ability to see in different ways um, uh, visually. Okay. Um, also, um, I think that they are often intuitive and are great at reading people and reading situations. And um, I have seen that in so many students who are dyslexic that mm -hmm. they are great people at people, uh, perceiving people's uh, emotions and strength. Good, Good. Uh, Dr. Talal? Yes, I would agree that visual um, perceptual strengths mm -hmm. are often characteristic of individuals with dyslexia. I don't know which came first, the inability to process the rapid auditory signals, and so the brain had to compensate by developing mm -hmm. stronger visual processing. But I never cease to be amazed at the number of cameramen who come oh to um, do interviews or whatever. It's not the person doing the interview, it's the cameraman who will often come <laughs> up to me uh, after Good. the interview, often with tears in his eyes about his own personal struggle with dyslexia and right. the shame involved. So that's one, and the other is perseverance and hard work. I mean, don't ever tell me that these kids aren't trying yeah. or don't care. They try so hard. They just don't have the neural capacities set mm -hmm. in place, and we can give them to them. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what's exciting. We have the tools now to help them build this foundational structure. Yeah. And then everything else we're hearing about is going to work better. Yep, absolutely. Um, Dr. Robillard. So I would agree with the perceptual reasoning. I think that 
they're typically very creative thinkers too. They they have to think differently. They're typically mm -hmm. very bright, and they've figured out ways to compensate for not being able to read, and so that helps them be very creative thinkers. So they're often the people that come up with that solution that nobody else thought of, um, and I think their second characteristic that I see over and over again that I think helps partially with that perseverance piece too is they have a great sense of humor. Uh -huh. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all very much. The ranking member, gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, is recognized for her questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have not yet signed on to this bill, not because I don't believe in it, but because I need some clarifications on how extensive the research is going to be. And so, Dr. Talal, I'd like to know, you talked about some research that you're doing and where some of it is coming to a close. Uh, what we're proposing here, is that going to extend your research or make it more comprehensive so we'll get all uh, students' ailments involved in the research? Or to tell me where you are. Okay. Well, this might seem unusual for a research scientist um, who has uh, uh, depended on government grants for a long time for my research. But I will agree with Dr. Sally Shaywitz last year that we have the knowledge that we need to improve the outcomes of millions of children. We're just not using it effectively. We don't have an appropriate roadmap. So my suggestions um, that I put into my longer report as well, my written report, is that we capitalize on what we already know and that we really focus on the translational path itself because it's so slow and tedious. We've been at this 20 years and we have very effective methods, but it's only been given to 12,000 children and that's just a drop in the bucket. We know we can do better, but we, the translational method itself needs a lot of work, and NSF can help with that. First of all, when someone proposes to do a research study that says that it aims to improve translation to education, show me the plan for where it shows how it's gonna be scaled up to the heterogeneous schools, teachers with different kinds of training, and students that's gonna work because that is not a simple thing. Doing it in your own laboratory with well-trained scientists is one thing. Getting it to work in the hands of Mrs. Smith or Mr. Jones in uh, uh, the Thomas Gibbs School, that's a very different thing. And to do that over and over again in 55 countries, which we've done, takes a lot of knowledge. We need to use some of that knowledge. Have you read the bill? Yes, I have. What would you do to improve it? Ah. <laughs> Um, I would focus on this translational process itself and including the professional de development part, and I would recognize that we need a two-way highway, a two-way superhighway. Too often, as researchers, we think our job is to um, do outreach and teach everyone what we know. I've learned as much from educators who are sitting in classrooms every day that are struggling with the process as I can teach them. It's got to be a two-way and a two-directional street. So I would put something in the bill that really reinforces and gives teachers and educators themselves the opportunity, not only for professional development, but I've even suggested the possibility of um, training grants or degrees for higher education where teachers can do their own PhDs in their own classrooms to try out some of the methods that are already coming from research. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Wilson, would you like to comment on that? I agree that implementation is the gap mm -hmm. that we need to address. And the more we can focus that aspect of the bill, I think that would be ideal because research has told us what we need to do and we have seen what works in schools and it is possible in public schools. Mm -hmm. um, I recently co-authored with Dr. Michelle Duda in a white paper for Literate Nation that talked about the policy to implementation gap. And it, there is a science to implementation called implementation science. And it talks about you can have an effective intervention, but that's only a small piece of it. You need to have effective implementation and an enabling context. So there's actually a formula that has been proven by implementation science, and it takes those three pieces of the formula 
to get the intended results. And so I would like um, to have some of the research look at looking at putting into practice that formula. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Would you yield me the balance of your time quickly? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get it. Looked at me. Yeah. Miss <laughs> Wilson, a question I didn't get to ask you a while ago is this: What's the difference in your approach to young people versus adults when it comes to dyslexia? That's a wonderful question. I I would also, and I'm so glad you asked that because I would also love to see research focus more on it's never too late because as important as early intervention is, and we know how important that is, in fact, if you do not identify a student early and start teaching an intervention in fourth grade as opposed to first grade, it takes four times as long to teach that student how to read. And so what happens as the student gets older is there's a lot more failure that you're working to overcome. Huh. And IEPs, and um, it, it, we know that IEPs after fourth grade often do not include the types of things that students with dyslexia By the need. nodding of heads, everybody else agrees with you on that. <laughs> uh, good point, thank you. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Westerman, is recognized for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, I would also like to uh, uh, thank you for your lead that you've taken on this issue. I know I'm, I'm a freshman here, but uh, we talked about this early, and I was excited that you're working so hard on this. I've told you about my wife, who's a special ed teacher, who is, uh, uh, you know, the biggest advocate for me is, is her asking if I've signed on to the Dyslexia Caucus, if I sponsored <laughs> this bill yet. <coughs> and, uh, um, and also, I'm happy that we've got a, a great bipartisan issue that we can work on because it's for uh, children in this country and it's really for, uh, for our future. Um, and it's so important that we teach children to read at an early age because it helps them out all, all through life. We all understand that. Matter, as a matter of fact, as has been mentioned today, there's a large body of research on dyslexia. Um, we know what it is. We know how to fix it. Um, we know how to identify it. We've even got fabulous technology that we can use in the process to help correct dyslexia. Um, but it's almost as if we've found the cure for cancer. We've developed the drugs to fix, to heal cancer, but we can't get those drugs into the pharmacy and out to the people uh, who need them. So I, I see this huge issue with implementation, and I can tell you a, a personal story on this. I was in the state legislature and I helped sponsor a bill in Arkansas to create our dyslexia law, much like Texas has done. And uh, the bill passed, and then we found out that the schools were totally unprepared to implement this law. They were, uh, the teachers were not trained for it. Uh, we found out that this training is not in the uh, institutions of higher education. I was glad to see, uh, Ms. Wilson, that you said there are six universities uh, that are implementing your, your program into their training, but I think we've got a huge gap at the higher education level in training teachers, and, and actually I think we're training teachers in reading programs that maybe even be detrimental to helping children with dyslexia. So um, I'm, I'm gonna put a plug in for my home state. We're doing a forum next March. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shaywitz is going to be there as the keynote speaker. Uh, I'm doing this in conjunction with our Department of Higher of Education. I'm going to have a forum there. And the focus of my forum is going to be how do we uh, improve this implementation gap. And I just want to get your ideas on the areas we need to address to uh, help the implementation, to get the teachers in the schools and the administrators trained and motivated to apply these fabulous tools that we've got so that we can help these kids and and reap all the benefits of that, and I'll start with Ms. Wilson. I find that special education teachers are, are very motivated. They recognize themselves that they don't have the skills, and I think we heard that earlier. Um, as a teacher, when you're working with students and you're not making a difference, you know it. Um, so I think the motivation is there. They just don't know what to do. And so the work with schools and school districts really has to begin with the administration 
and educating the administration as to what is needed for the professional learning. And so we, we develop plans with school district called compass plans, which are comprehensive plans that occur over two, one or two years um, to help train the teachers. And we first work with the school district to see where are their gaps. Do they have teachers that are trained? And we... And I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a lot of time. I talk too much. Oh. But the, uh, <laughs> I, I understand there are ways you can go into individual schools, but in the bigger picture, we've got to train teachers at the higher education level. And I've seen a resistance for the departments of higher education to take in these new, new take on these new programs. How do we infiltrate that and get teachers taught this so that when they come out of college, they're ready to to help children? That is a major gap. Um, the International Dyslexia Association um, has also taken on that issue. Um, and a paper was written on um, the, um, let me get, I'm trying to think of the name of it, um, Knowledge and Practice Standards for Teachers of Reading. And it's a great document that really outlines both the knowledge and the skills that teachers need. And it really specifies this is what we should be doing in, in colleges of education. And I was one of the co-authors of that. And they're working to get that word out to universities. Um, but there is so much need absolutely at the university level. Thank you. And I, I, you'll, I guess I'm negative on yielding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Westman. The gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. Estes, is recognized. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ra Ranking Member Johnson, for holding today's hearing. And as the mother of three who's been in those first grade classrooms and seen very bright kids who are struggling, as somebody who comes from a state where our governor, Dan Malloy, by his own admission, is profoundly dyslexic, was the first person in the state of New York to have an oral bar exam mm -hmm. as a level of his dyslexia, had his wife read his law books to him, is an example of the kind of stellar people we have who mm -hmm. happen to also be dyslexic. And to your category, Dr. Robillard, I would ask every tradesperson I know who is super creative is terrible at reading. And they put their creativity into working with their hands mm -hmm. and that spatial ability. So we have enormous innovators who are hampered and oftentimes beaten down, mm -hmm. discouraged, told they're stupid, mm -hmm. made to feel unsuccessful. So I see an enormous opportunity for this country. And I'm so delighted that, as you can tell here, there's a lot of enthusiasm on the part of this committee and elsewhere in Congress to do a better job. So, so let's figure out how we do that. Um, I was encouraged, Dr. Talal, by your discussion about neuroplasticity. And particularly when we look at prison populations, we look at people looking for retraining. Can you talk a little bit about the research we might need to do on that? In addition for children, how do we get this neuroplasticity training at work for adults who need this help as well? Right. Well, the good news is that neuroplasticity lasts a lifetime. And the same variables that drive neuroplasticity, which are repetition, 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 individually adapting from easier to harder items, sustained attention, and timely rewards to release neurochemical uh, feedback, saying that was a good one, save it, are the same throughout life. Uh, yes, it may be harder because people have older people have developed more alternate strategies, but we have developed um, versions of Fast for Word for all ages. It's been shown to work in colleges. It's been shown to work in prisons. The big problem that we have getting our um, methods into prisons is the um, fact that we require the uh, computer and the internet to give mm -hmm. feedback on a mouse click by mouse click basis so we can individually adapt. These are highly technological methods. Um, and many prisons don't allow the internet. But you can get around that by having servers. Nonetheless, the results are very encouraging that neuroplasticity lasts a lifetime. Just have to know how to drive it. And it needs to be driven by computers first and then backed up by what teachers do best. Let computers do what computers do best, which are also much more scalable at a more economical level so that teachers can do what teachers do best. That, that makes a great deal of sense. Uh, the chairman and I have worked a lot on STEM education and support for teachers, and I hear a lot of the same issues that we face in the STEM field. We have great programs that work. We need to scale them, and we need to get that information out in a way. So, so one thing I would ask you, because we've seen this on the STEM field with the noise master teaching 
uh, program mm -hmm. is whether we need something like that to help show, I think part of it is to show teachers how effective this is. To, to get them into yeah. classrooms and see what right. the teacher who's trained with these skills to see what a difference they can make so that they embrace it, mm -hmm. not as a requirement, but rather as an opportunity to help students mm -hmm. who are otherwise struggling. If you don't understand neuroplasticity or how the brain actually learns, which is what these science of learning centers are all about, if you don't understand that children um, who are struggling or, or adults who are struggling to read don't have not built the foundational first and second floor, and you keep hammering away at trying to give them more time to build the third floor, um, and you have never been taught that in your educational programs, you're not going to understand why these programs, when you look at them, could possibly work. Um, so you need the professional development or changes within the teachers' colleges themselves, which is much, more hard to, much harder to come by, in order to people to even understand why something might need to be done, what the science shows, and then why these tools might be effective. A final question, as we try to figure out how to scale up, and we have all are talking about the scale up issue, do you think that in this legislation, or perhaps in other legislation, we need to be having research that demonstrates the effect of teaching skills that would lead to faster dissemination and acceptance? What I mean by scaling up is that if we say that our goal for getting funding from NSF is translation to education, I think the bill could ask for explicit criteria for evaluation and priority to those methods and approaches that have more potential to actually be scaled up for use in a wide variety of classrooms. And many of them do not. I mean, I see. We, as scientists and as NSF um, starts to evaluate, they're always looking at the theory, the science, the double-blind control study. I think we also need to really reevaluate whether a double-blind control study is ecologically or morally sound for an educational environment as the only gold standard for determining eff <coughs> efficacy. I think cumul cumulative data <coughs> over a lot of different approaches is what really will help move this bar for education rather than demanding that there's only one kind of evidence that works. Thank you, and that's a provocative one we can follow up on later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Esty. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, is recognized for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. My daughter is finishing her uh, graduate degree at Auburn University in speech pathology. And Fabulous. And uh, she had to have speech therapy when she was little, so I know how important this work is. Uh, Dr. Talal, uh, um, we have a school, Spring Valley uh, School in Birmingham, that specializes in teaching children with learning disabilities. And according to information from that school, individuals affected by dyslexia are often affected by other learning disabilities as well. Can you discuss the interaction of dyslexia and other disabilities and the challenge that this presents for students and, and the teachers? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. Uh, our brain is not divided easily into compartments. When you have a problem in one area, it often will cascade into other areas. When you have a problem with how the brain can efficiently process incoming sensory information, that is going to cascade in a number of ways into other um, functions, cognitive functions, linguistic <coughs> functions that subsequently impact reading. So I think that is Basically, the finding is that there's a tremendous overlap when you get right down to it, and great heterogeneity in children whose final common denominator is they cannot learn to read. But there are many subskills that could have led, <coughs> led them there. Many of these children are diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, and at a scientific level, did you fail to pay attention because you couldn't process fast and efficiently, or can you not fail to process fast and efficiently because you can't pay attention? So we do need to still understand that. So Many children are diagnosed with autism spectrum mm -hmm. disorder. That is a language-based learning disability. So when we talk about ex uh, increasing funding for research on dyslexia, I, I think we need to also be talking about some overlap with in the research in this area, how these other disabilities interact and and and. Follow that out. Uh, the doc? diagnosis you get often depends on just who you got sent to see. 
Right. Okay, if you got sent to see a psychiatrist, you're going to get one diagnosis. If you got sent to see a speech pathologist, you could get a different diagnosis. If you got sent to see a reading specialist, and it also depends on the age at which your disability is finally diagnosed. But that doesn't mean they're all mutually exclusive from each other. It really sounds like we need to be able to, to have a one shop, one stop shop um, when we're dealing in these areas because if you get misdiagnosed, it's kind of like uh, firing a, a rifle at a target. If you're off a little bit at the, the front end, you're off a lot at the back end. Uh, Dr. Robillard, in your testimony, you highlighted the approach you're taking Austin to better serve st students with dyslexia. Uh, what are you doing in Austin that's different uh, than, than approaches taken in other schools? I think what we did in Austin was we took that science to practice seriously the last two years. I. Uh, I left the ivory tower to come back and do this because I would, I would diagnose them as a neuropsychologist and I would send a lovely report to the school district and nothing would happen. And so I got a little frustrated and finally decided to put my money where my mouth was and went back to try to see what I could do with it and had wonderful backing of our board of trustees. That's where our, our process started was getting their support and then getting our superintendent on board. And teaching, I actually would go teach our board of trustees. They invited me to come teach them about dyslexia, teach our superintendent about dyslexia. And from there, we were able to, we now have in every school in Austin, 129 of them, 85,000 kids in our school district, we have what's called a dyslexia designee on every campus. And that person has been taught what these ladies have been talking about all after, afternoon, and they have they understand now on that level. We've also brought in evidence-based, multi-sensory, Orton-Gillingham-based uh, programs for all grade levels. We have changed the diagnostic process. We used to have classroom teachers doing this diagnosis when many kids went misdiagnosed. So sadly, I'm diagnosing students that are in high school now that never got diagnosed early, but we're diagnosing them now and we're intervening now because the neuroplasticity is there, and if you have the right tools, you can make a huge difference in their lives by getting the right diagnosis and getting those intervention materials. So we've, we've made a concerted effort to not only get those highly trained cults, but to get training for all of our teachers, K through 12, in at least the understanding of dyslexia, and then at every grade level have teachers trained who are both special education, and we address a lot of dyslexia in Texas by 504 under the ADA. So we do it in the regular education setting with teachers that are trained on the materials to deliver them in the gen ed classroom. Mr. Chairman, would you uh, allow me to ask a question to Ms. Wilson? Uh, yes, the gentleman continues to be recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Wil Wilson, you were talking about your reading program. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, is there uh, a distance learning component for this when children are out of school so that parents can continue to be involved with their kids and, and continue to, to help them learn? Yes, there is distance learning actually for teachers, and so the teachers um, can learn. Uh, in terms of teachers who are trained, they will often do distance learning because of technology. That's one of the things that technology has brought um, with the fast internet and the ability to do work in observations over line. So um, there are some uh, teachers who are actually providing instruction to students um, distantly. So they're providing the instruction to the students when the students are out of school, and is it participating? Uh, is it a program where parents can participate in this program with their kids? That is, it's not something that we organize because we focus on teacher training, and so mm -hmm. that would be something that the school or uh, or the teacher themselves would organize. Um, but if that were the case and they were working, yes, the parents could be involved with that at home. Um, parents' work at home um, is just in a support role as opposed to an instructional role. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Palmer. The gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, is recognized for her questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses today. Um, I have to tell you, I was sitting here a little bit earlier. I think it was the chairman who asked, um, you know, what the positives are for young people, for people who have uh, dyslexia, and it made me tear up because you were describing my son. Um, and uh, and it's a, it was a reminder as a parent um, and as educators how important it is to value 
all of the person that these young people are and how that can contribute to their eventual learning success. Um, and I'm, I was really uh, curious, Dr. Talal, in your um, testimony, you talked about a description that wasn't dyslex didn't say dyslexia, dyslexia but a language-based learning problem, a more inclusive way of thinking about the way that our some of our, our children are learning differently. And I think that that's really helpful because I think it's important for us to say what it is and for people, uh, especially our young people, to feel like we're talking about them and that we're trying to work on strategies that help them to learn the best way that they can. Uh, it was also a reminder that in the, um, in the READ Act, of which I'm a co-sponsor, that we may have some tweaking um, to do, to try to make sure that we're capturing the elements of research and of uh, teacher training and other aspects that you've identified in the knowledge gap from the action, uh, from the action gap. And so I thank you uh, for that. I just came from um, a celebration of 50 years of Head Start. I love Head Start. Um, but it was also another reminder that for children not of means, and Dr. Talal, you talked about this 30 million word deficit, that being able to identify um, learning-based um, uh, conditions is really important in that early period, especially among young people not of means. And so I wonder if you could describe for me what we might begin to think about programs like Head Start, where we know when young people get a good Head Start that they really can succeed, but what we can do in teacher um, training and working with educators to give them the tools in uh, something like Head Start that will enable us to identify these conditions earlier and to deal with ways that we can um, can make sure that young people have the tools that they need. And I'll just give you the rest of the time and all of you the time to talk about that. Well, I love what Head Start has done. I completely agree with you on that. And I would just say that if we now could also add some of these new technologies, they will even further boost the advantages uh, of Head Start. We need to get more words and more consistently pronounced words. There's a reason that a child, a young child, when asked to have a storybook read to them, despite the fact that they may have several books to go, they always want to pick the same book. Have, ever you, have you ever experienced that? The parent's going, oh, not again. But why does the child want the same book? Because the brain is reinforced by being able to predict what is about to come next and then have it happen. And books are great for that, and repetition is great for that. So there are also some wonderful technologies that can allow children to receive more consistent reading patterns through books, either through a human giving them to them if they're available, or just by being able to have some books that are being read to them. Our second product is Reading Assistant, which I haven't talked much about. But what Reading Assistant is, is it is a scientifically based, um, state-of-the-art recognition, uh, voice recognition software that allows a child to read out loud to the computer and get real-time, one-on-one feedback, like a virtual tutor. There's a tremendous amount of research that shows that if you want to build reading fluency, the only way to do that is to allow a child to read more out loud with corrective feedback, but who has the time to give each child that individual attention? Again, we can use some of these technological advances to add to what teachers are able to do. And it's a partnership, I think, at this point between technology, what let technology do what technology can do so that teachers can do what they can do. So I would say adding some of these new technologies, um, iPads, you know, there's some, what are you gonna put on your iPad? Let's get some programs that are very well identified and um, researched and evidence-based to provide to some of these younger children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Ms. Edwards. Uh, the gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Comstock, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. I, I joined the enthusiastic uh, response of, of the other members of the committee. Um, I'm from a family of educators. My husband was in school. He was an assistant principal certainly saw this issue quite a bit 
oftentimes with the children who might be, uh, since he was the assistant principal, some of the kids would get in trouble, right? Because they're acting out in some ways. Um, my sister's a guidance counselor. My mom was a librarian. So I've uh, seen a lot of this. So um, I was interested in maybe following up on the technology. Um, now that I have three grandchildren also, how can we make parents sort of be partners? And what are some of the good things that are already online? Are there things on iPads? Are there things that you can start doing with young children that help you identify if there are early problems and help the par parents be partners with you and with others and, and, you know, and their contemporaries? Mm -hmm. Well, we have actually come out with a um, distance learning component, as you might call it, um, speaking to Mr. Palmer's uh, question earlier. Um, that is a direct, um, is fast for word that is run uh, by parents in their own home with children mm -hmm. across the many ages in collaboration with a trained um, therapist who talks to, or teacher that talks to the parents once a week. So there's a lot that parents can do to use these technologies, but the, the beauty is that they don't have to have the educational level of a trained professional to be able to mm -hmm. implement. What parents can do is implement something when it's really running individually and individually adaptive for a child and just keep them motivated to do it and help with reinforcement that way. So there's a, a lot that parents can do with these technologies. We also have kind of forayed a little bit into early math learning and developed a program mm -hmm. called Eddie's Number Party, which is just oh, a little okay. app. Okay. Um, and it teaches the number line. So research is coming out with all this information, as is education. And the question is, how do you work together with the people who know how to motivate kids now through developing computer games to do something with their time which is more valuable? And I think that's a great way also to focus in the future of how do we make what kids are going to be doing and wanting to do anyway, playing with these computers, something that's going to actually mm -hmm. teach them the fundamental skills that are going to set, their, set them up early in life for success in math, in oral language, in written language, et cetera. And um, you know, with, with the online and then also maybe in, you, you talked about the, just the language exposure and having kids exposed to more words, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, I hear from my kids now when they're dealing with having their children, they won't put them in front of television. I was a big Sesame Street lover, and I did yeah. park them in front of that at the arsenic hour at 4 o'clock and, yeah. and let them watch. Um, and they were all very early readers, and they learned that, that. I mean, I thought that Sesame Street did a very nice job on the alphabet and having them understand that. Um, but now I'm, oh, we can't let them in front of the TV before they're two years old. Uh, is, is that, is that true? <laughs> Did I totally mess up my early reading children? <laughs> well, there's a difference, I think. I think the, it's, the question is interactivity between uh, adults and children. In the best of situations, the very best thing you can do is have parents who are talking to children and reading with children in a clear, consistent way. But that's not going to happen in most environments. So then what else can you do? Uh, passive observation does not work to drive neuroplasticity. That's one of the factors that we do know. Uh, you have to actively pay attention. So if a child is actively paying attention to what's going on on an educational program like Sesame Street, it's going to be helpful. But if they're just passively listening, it probably isn't. Where computers, again, can be better than mm -hmm. that is that they can provide similar information but give one-on-one, -on -one, indiv individually, real-time feedback. So it's much more interactive. It much more simulates the parent-child or teacher-child interactions in real time. And that's the, cl the clue. In real time and personally, individually adaptive to your brain, so you're moving at the speed that your brain is getting about 80% correct. Right. Any other comments? Any others? I think the assistive technology piece is key, and we have an assistive technology person that's on our staff that goes out and works with our students as they get they get explicit instruction to start, and then as they're getting better at reading, we use more and more assistive technology, uh, not only to, for their reading, but for their writing, which is dysgraphia is, is really connected to this reading issue of dyslexia. And so we find that many of our students who are dyslexic are dysgraphic as well, and there's wonderful apps for that and wonderful assistive technology applications for that. Uh, the University of Edinburgh actually has some great apps that we put on our kids' iPads that um, help them out 
in, in schools uh, with dyslexia and dysgraphia and de decoding and encoding and immediate feedback sorts of things um, and help them with their writing as well. So I think assistive technology, that uh, the, the explicit multisensory systematic sequential teaching, that's the Orton Gellingham method, I think is always going to be inherent in helping our dyslexic kids get to that place where they can read but the technology of the repetition that they need in order to build those new, new neural pathways that are more successful for reading than the ones that they came to us with, I think, is, is really key. And, and I'd ask uh, the chairman if, for our record, we can maybe include a lot of those apps and websites and anything that you think might be good just sort of as a demonstration so we can sort of uh, put them on our websites, let people know about them in any way we can be promoting this information and help, and, and thank you a lot. Look forward to working with you. Good idea. Thank you, Ms. Comstock. And the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byers, recognized for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll begin by thanking the chairman and the ranking member for ha having this hearing this morning. And chairman, thank you for your leadership on this issue. Very important. And I'd like to thank you for showing up. I'd like to want to pile on an assistive technology, too. My oldest. Uh, has this wide variety of learning disabilities, and in fourth grade, he could still not read at all. Until I bought, brought a PC home with Sierra games, which were text-based, and you could only get through the adventure if you could type and spell the words correctly. And in six months, he went from barely being able to read to reading on grade level, and now he's got a townhouse full of books. So it's, it's really terrific stuff to do that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Robillard, um, in your written testimony, you, you said, and probably the spoken too, that, quote, dyslexia is not a disorder that can be compartmentalized. It's not just a deficit, but also carries inherent strengths that can be recognized, that have been recognized for decades. In his school, the Oakwood School out in Fairfax, they had big pictures of Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, Winston Churchill. Uh, the most fiery political speaker I've ever known was the majority leader of the Virginia House, who never had a note because he couldn't read them because his learning disabilities were so bad, but he was an incredible orator. How do we make sure that these strengths, um, these inherent strengths, are not suppressed? How do we recognize them and celebrate them? Well, I think we have to really do that PD police piece, that, that part that we're teaching our teachers to recognize this. Our universities, and I have to say I've been a part of our universities that have not taught our pre-service teachers about dyslexia as well as we should have. We fortunately in Texas now have, since House Bill 5, a little piece in there that says all higher education entities that are training teachers will teach about dyslexia now, and we're starting to do that. I think that getting at that basic level of making sure all educators, all administrators recognize that just because the student has dyslexia, that they are still able to do so many other things, and they are, they are so capable in so many other areas that contribute to their non-dyslexic counterparts that may not be able to see the world or understand the world as well as they can in other ways, I think is, is really key in making that happen. And I think it's, a, it's an education from the ground up. It's, it's not just our teachers, but our principals, our assistant principals who are often disciplining these kids because they often have creative ways of thinking about doing things. Um, I think that our, our administrators really need to understand it as well, and that's been a, a, a gr grassroots effort in our district to Thank help you. our administrators understand that. Thank you very much. Dr. Talal, uh, the READ Act provides a definition for dyslexia that captures everyone who has difficulty reading despite normal intelligence. Again, I think of my son who never had the reverse letters dyslexia, it was um, soft vowel differentiation, sequencing difficulties, specific word recall, it was always that red stuff in the refrigerator rather than ketchup, you know. Um, how broadly or narrowly should we define dyslexia and, and does it matter in terms of intervention? That's an excellent question. Um, the research, um, I think primarily uh, by Martha Dankla and many other well-established and well-respected dyslexia researchers have shown, despite tremendous research and study, that there seems to be no difference between children who have a frank diagnosis of dyslexia and those who, for research purposes, are called garden variety poor readers. So there's no difference in their symptomatology, and importantly, there does not seem to be a great difference or any difference that we can discern about what works to improve their outcomes. One of the things that is often um, used in definitions of dyslexia is that children have failed to learn to 
read despite normal intelligence and opportunity to learn to read. And that's an important statement as well. But there usually is a word that says unexpected reading problems. And what concerns me about that is that if a child comes from a high socioeconomic family of very of successful people and they are failing to learn to read, that's quite unexpected. But if the child is coming from poverty or from a family that um, doesn't have English as their primary language and that child fails to learn to read, people aren't that surprised. Well, the truth is that even though they got to their reading problem in very different ways along different avenues, they all seem to need the same kind of intensive repetition at the auditory processing and spoken language level to break the code for reading. So if we want to use a definition of dyslexia, I think there is value to bringing attention to the fact that there's so many children failing to learn to read, but it also can have the effect of limiting the school's sense of responsibility for children who don't have a frank diagnosis. And you may want to speak to that. Yeah. And we run a camp in the summer for high school kids who are still struggling readers. And we have now interjected all of our English language learners who have some capacity for English. And we're finding that our dyslexic students have the opportunity to help these kids learn to read mm -hmm. as well, and that they are benefiting from the same methodology, the same repetition, the same assistive technology, and are moving ahead and reading much quicker than their counterparts who are English language learners who don't come to this summer program. And in six weeks, we have statistically measurable differences in their fluency and their comprehension scores. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beyer. Uh, let me recognize myself for a final quick question to Dr. Robillard. Uh, one area we haven't covered today is the possibility uh, and connection between adults with dyslexia and adults that have behavioral problems. And I know you've been aware of some research at the University of Texas about that. Can you comment real quickly on anything we need to address or anything we need to know, and then we'll, we'll finish up? Well, I think it's significant that we have this school to prison pipeline that is full of dyslexic students who were either undiagnosed or misdiagnosed or just struggling readers even who were misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. And the research about 10 years ago, 2004, I believe, Dr. Falbo at UT did quite a bit of research on this population and found about 80% of our prisons in Texas had prisoners who had dyslexia or some form of, of reading disorder. Recently, this summer, in July of this, this year, uh, current year, new research came out, similar research, says 85% of our prisoners have dyslexia or a related disorder. That is a huge, huge number of people. Right. And the logical conclusion is if we could have helped them earlier, we may not have had the kind of um, um, problems that they've uh, exemplified later in life. Okay. I, I think there is a correlation. Okay. I, I don't know that we can say it's a cause and effect, but I think there's a very high correlation, and okay. I think they do uh, affect uh, each other. Thank you for that answer. Also, let me thank you all for your testimony today. This has been very, very informative. I have to end with a little bit of a plug for the state of Texas, because I think we're a little bit of the head of the curve, or we're certainly ahead of a number of other states uh, because of legislation that has been passed, and uh, we mandate the recognition of dyslexia in our school districts and mandate that the uh, school districts have a program of early detection, and I only wish all school districts across the country had that as well. Uh, so again, thank you. Just a reminder, the reception is down the hall this way to my left at the very end of the hall. Look forward to seeing you all there, and we stand adjourned. And here I am with my complete clean page. <laughs> I know.